On today's episode, I'm going to talk about my buys for the week and why I believe these are better investments than the overall market for me. Like many of my viewers, I put money into the market on a weekly basis. So every week I'm either looking for a new position or way or where to increase my overall exposure. For each stock, we will look at what they do, revenue breakdown, recent news, future growth, and my thoughts, even mentioning some of the risks that I see with these stocks. Like always, if you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and don't forget to hit the thumbs up. It helps the small channel out so much and I truly, truly appreciate it. Remember, none of this should be taken as advice as I am not a professional and this is just my opinion. And before we go any further, let me know in the comments if you guys are buying anything. It's great to share with the community. And while you're down there, don't forget to join the Discord channel. It's free to anybody that wants to join. And click that Weibo link if you guys sign up and follow the rules there. We both could get a free stock. All right, so the first stock I purchased this week is EA Games, and this is ticker EA. Also, if you want a full written report on the company from cash flow to margins and much more, feel free to check out my Patreon where I drop weekly reports on the stocks I buy. If you guys believe the amount of information I provide here is insane, I can't wait for you guys to see these weekly reports that I'm dropping. Um, the amount of, of time I spend doing this is just insane. So right now, current price for EA Games is sitting at $126.77 after hours. Market cap for this company right now is sitting at $36.6 billion. So it's not a huge monster right now, but it's definitely not a small company. Year-to-date returns are about 18.1%, and right now it's down about 13% from its all-time high for the year. So let's take a quick look at what EA Game does. So EA Game, like I mentioned, is a huge gaming company. They have a very strong catalog from EA Sports. In the EA Sports, they have like NHL, they have FIFA, they have Madden, they have UFC, and I believe they have other ones as well. They also have the Need for Speed catalog. They have The Sims, which has such a strong community. And they also have Star Wars. They have rights to certain Star Wars uh, about a year ago. I think they released Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, which did amazing to the community. And this past month, they released Star Wars Squ Squadron. They also have Command and Conquer, which is kind of an old game, uh, but one that I enjoyed a lot. And they also have some of their original games. So there is huge potential for EA games in both esports world we can see with all these very um very i want to say competitive games like especially the sporting games and with mobile gaming right now mobile gaming is exploding and all these games can actually be moved to somehow into the mobile platform which is seeing huge amount of growth if we take a look at their revenue breakdown it's very very simple in the full year of 2020 or for the fiscal year of 2020 they produced about 5.4 billion dollars of net bookings and out of that 5.4 about 33 percent comes from full games this is exactly what it stands for full games when you go purchase a full game from ea games you can it can either be a digital game or it can be the physical uh, physical copy that makes 33% of total revenue. The other 66 or so percent comes from packs, services, subscriptions that EA Games might have. And this is called live, ser live services and others. Um, for example, in, in, in FIFA, I'm pretty sure you can buy like players. In, in Star Wars, you can buy like certain lightsabers, certain cosmetic things that don't really affect much of the gameplay. I'm pretty sure in maybe in these, in these sporting games, I don't play much of them, but they might be like new teams or maybe like new new uniforms, just cosmetic aspects. Or sometimes they have like a subscription pack of, of yearly, a yearly pass or so. Next, let's take a look at the future growth of EA Games. Forecasted growth is not high for EA right now. It's sitting at 6.1% for the next three to five years on average. Um, so it's definitely not a fast growing company, but that's okay, right? I'm not... If you guys have been looking at my portfolio, you might think I'm just seeking for growth stock. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes I'm okay taking a decent amount of growth uh, or a slow, slower amount of growth if the company is strong, if it's in the market I'm very bullish on, or if I maybe believe right now these estimates, because these are all based on estimates, are on the conservative side. And all those I feel are ticking for EA Games. So now let me talk about some of the main reasons I bought EA Games. 
So the first is video game numbers are still rising uh, right now, especially with the whole pandemic thing, people staying at home and not going out as much. There has been huge growth in the video game sector. But even before this, I've been very bullish in the gaming industry, even before the pandemic. So even without the pandemic, I still believe these gaming companies were going to see strong growth. This upcoming holidays, we're getting the new system coming out in actually in about two, three weeks, the new PS5, the new PlayStation and the new Xbox come out. So this is going to, again, increase that overall revenue. Mobile, mobile gaming is something that's hitting new highs. And with such a strong catalog, a lot of these games can be transferred over to the mobile game and allow more users to enter the EA game platform. Right now, they are in the clouding game and the clouding business as well with EA Play, and they've partnered up with Xbox Game Pass, which is another gaming cloud um, subscription. So again, that's a strong um, that's a strong partnership when you're working with Xbox Games, and you're going to collect a monthly revenue off of that. They also have strong cash flow margins, and they have a very strong balance sheet. Now, let me take a look at some of the major risks that I see with with EA Games. The first thing every company has it but there is always this bit of negative sentiment from its customers every time you release something the customers don't like it and they're pretty loud about it and sometimes ea game has been known to like really try to milk their consumers their customers and not really care about what they like we saw the whole star wars tobacco we see right now with the sims uh, a few arguments going there so there is that negative sentiment from some of its customers Another risk I see is once COVID is done, there might there I, I do believe there will be a slowdown in sales. But again, I've been bullish in the e-gaming market in the gaming market even before the pandemic. So even though I do believe there will be a slowdown in sales, um, it's going to go back to the numbers I orig I originally foresaw. The third risk is this is definitely not a fast growth company, um, but that's okay with me. I still believe this will be better than the overall market. All right, now let's take a look at the second stock I bought. The second stock is Redfin. This is ticker RDFN to all my podcast listeners. Current price right now is sitting at about $44.96. It has a market cap of about $4.5 billion. Year to date return right now is sitting at about 108%. So it's been amazing to investors. Um, right now, it's down about 19% from its all time highs of the year. So now let's take a look at what Redfin does. So Redfin is pretty much a real estate broker, an online real estate broker, right? Redfin's business model is based on sellers paying Redfin a small fee to list the seller's home. And they do this at a cheaper price than the typical real estate way. They also provide other services during the buying and selling process, like off they do um, brokerage, I buy mortgages, title services, and they also run the country's number one real estate brokerage search site, offering a host of online tools to consumers. Many of you guys might have used their website of just using them to search for maybe rental properties, your new home, or just to overall check out how your house, how, how your house um, estimate is doing right now. So Redfin, again, very sim very simple companies. I like to look at companies that are very simple to understand because this helps me really learn what the company does and see how the market will react to certain use. So Redfin makes about 65% per, of its sales from services. We can see here real estate services mainly comes from brokerage revenue. This is, this is the fees they collect when things sell out. The remaining 35% comes from Others, and mainly here comes property revenues, includes property. So sometimes Redfin buys an, a property where they believe they can resell. Right now, the only segment though that provides that gross profitability is the service section. That property's revenue is still negative. Um, real estate service right now due to COVID-19 definitely took a big hit in 20 in this second quarter. We can see compared to the same time last year, there was a decrease in brokerage revenue, um, but there was an increase of properties revenue. But that's something to definitely um, keep an eye out right now, right? With a lot of people staying at home, not understanding how the overall, how the overall world was going to be shaping. I don't think many people were buying homes. Again, this is from their um, second quarter, which ended June 30th. So that was about three months ago. A lot has changed since then. So right now, forecasted growth for Redfin is incredibly high at 24.3%. 
on annual average for the next three to five years. So this is definitely a super growth company. Anything growing over 15% on average annually is what I consider a high growth. Some of the main reasons I bought Redfin. So first, Redfin does not fall in my typical tech stock portfolio. So a lot of people might be confused why I enter this. But as an upcoming real estate investor, I see the power of the online real estate broker and how it's disrupting the current state of things. Um, so that's something I do enjoy. Um, Redfin also recently issued a new senior notes for 2025, which will be used to reflush debt they owe in 2020 and 2023. So they had some notes due on 2023. So right now with rates being so low, they just got new notes for 2025. They're gonna use that proceeds to pay that 2023 debt in full. So now they're like I mentioned, reflushing that debt. They're moving it into a later time, and then they're gonna use the remaining for working capital and other corporate purposes. I do believe when when a lot of invest when investors see some form of senior notes issued, it causes a form of price reduction. So I do believe that has helped um, pull back a bit on Redfin. Um, though there right now, even though second quarter was a slowdown in the real estate market, we can see. I do believe now things are picking back up. It is still a very impressive housing market, at least especially where I'm at in, in, in New Jersey, right? House prices right now are higher than they were before. Um, so that obviously means more commission revenue. If, if you have higher prices you're getting, even though you're still only charging a low percentage, now that revenue you're collecting is gonna be a lot higher. The major risk I see with Redfin right now is one, the cash flow statement is pretty weak at the moment. Two, the company is not profitable. Three, they do have a nice amount of competition from the typical brokers that can eventually move into the sector. And from Scylla, one that kind of is in the similar market and its own property, its own websites, its own algorithm to do it. Uh, but for those reasons, I was very, very strict, strict with this balance sheet, which allowed me to, which allowed me to cut, not overlook but at least, at least be a bit more comfortable by owning Redfin and buying because they do have a very strong balance sheet. Obviously, COVID can really mess this business up if we have a second wave and if things aren't reacting how we want them to react and shutdowns start to happen all over the world again. That can definitely um, hurt this business. All right, so the third stock we're going to take a look at is Doju. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing this one properly. Um, this is ticker D O Y U. Current price is fifteen dollars and seven cents. Right now it has a market cap of about four point eight billion dollars. Year to date returns are about seventy percent, and from its all time highs of the year is down about fourteen percent. So we can see the pullback did come from September, and there the, some of these companies did pull back a nice amount. So if you guys don't know, Doju is one I've talked about uh, plenty of be uh, before, and I've actually talked about one of its competitors, Huya, which is a tier one stock for me. So Douyu International Holdings is a leading game-centric live streaming platform in China, and it's a pioneer in the esports world. So if you guys don't know live streaming, if you guys know about Twitch, this is pretty much the Twitch of China. This is Facebook gaming of China or YouTube gaming. Um, so one great thing about this is it actually allows us to see what games are popular. I went onto this website, we can see League of Legends, Player Unknowns, Crossfires, King of Glory, Peace Elite. Um, a lot of these games are actually owned by Tencent. Wink, wink. And that's actually pretty, pretty cool, pretty impressive to see. So let's take a look at that revenue breakdown for Doju. So about 92% of their sales comes from live streaming revenues. And this is actually up 35% for the most recent quarter. This live streaming revenues is fees they collect. For example, if you're watching a streamer and you send them a gift, when you send them a gift or some donations, Doju gets a, a percentage just like in Twitch. In Twitch, when you send your streamer a, a, a gift, Twitch keeps some of that money. When you send, when you buy something here on, on, on Facebook, on YouTube, right? If you buy an item, from my store from my um, store right now that I have down below if you buy them YouTube takes some portion of it and that's pretty much how that works um, and this makes up a huge portion about 92% of total revenue and like we see it's up 35% compared to the same time last year the other 8% comes from advertisement and other revenues just like here on YouTube Twitch 
doju, huya, they get ads when you watch. So that's where that other revenue, it's 8%, not a big number, um, but it's definitely also seeing growth compared to the same time last year. So now let's take a look at the forecasted growth for doju. And this is very strong, growing at 17.9% on average, on annual average for the next three to five years. This is definitely a super growth company. Some of the reasons I purchased this company is, as I mentioned earlier before, I am very bullish on the gaming industry. Even before the pandemic, right? I've been bullish here. Doju is set in a great place as a tool for these gamers and game companies to show off their skills and content. And it doesn't matter what is the best game out there or who is the best streamer. If they're using Doju, um, it, that's the tool, right? So it doesn't matter who the best game is. They're going to use Doju regardless. They're going to be some of the streamers going to pick them and use Doju. So I like the tool when i invest one of my favorite things is to invest in the tool within the market that's i i expect to grow and esports is a market streaming is a market i believe is going to grow and the tools for that are actually the streaming services so that's why doju made the list here we recently heard that the merger has been approved for huya who with huya and doju which is their competitor and now this secures doju and huya to be the leading platform in china which is one of the Biggest populations in the world, right? And with a huge gaming population as well. So with games like League of Legends, Call of Duty, um, and Free Fire. A lot of games that are actually backed up by the giant gaming company Tencent. Right now, with the transfer rate of Huya and Doju, it makes more sense for me to buy Doju opposed to Huya. Even though I'm personally a little bit more bullish on Huya. But with the merger happening, again, there's always that small risk that it cannot happen. And that's why there's always a, a there's always a gap or difference between that exchange rate, um, between the exchange rate and the actual prices right now. Um, and right now, with that risk, I believe it's giving me an opportunity to add into Huya by buying Doju for better rates. Some of the major risk I've seen with Doju is one, this is an international company, especially in a country that is having huge tension with the United States right now, uh, which might make this a very volatile market, especially with, the, with, especially with the elections coming up real soon. It's also in a country that many have, um, that many have talked about that is very limited to its citizens. You can see um, it, can, it can potentially limit gameplay or even the games played within that country. For those reasons, I limit my exposure to percentage in international companies and companies in China. Um, and that allows me to kind of manage this risk. Now let's take a look at the fourth company. And this is a big boy compared to every other one we looked at. The fourth stock is Microsoft ticker MSFT. And don't forget, if you got like I mentioned before, if you guys want to see a full written report on these companies from cash flows to margins and much more, feel free to check out my Patreon to support the channel and get these weekly reports. Current price right now is sitting at $216 for Microsoft. Market cap is $1.6 trillion dollars year-to-date returns are about 34.62 percent and they're down about six percent from all-time highs of this year not much of a pullback compared to those other ones we saw uh, so microsoft is definitely in multiple sectors from cloud provider for, for example cloud with its out, uh, azure market it's also in the gaming business in the cloud gaming it's in the overall enterprise productivity and consumer software Revenue breakdown for this company is 31% from its total revenue comes from productivity and business process, 35% comes from the intelligent cloud, and 33% comes from the more personal computing. So within those three sectors, it's actually pretty equally diversified among those three. And I think that's actually pretty good and pretty impressive, right? Uh, you don't want one sector being the major leading force for your company. And those are very deep sectors, and I want to break down a bit more what they mean. So in the productivity and business process, here you have your, like, your office consumer, your Office 365, Microsoft Office, your subscription base in the consumer world and in the commercial world. You have your LinkedIn revenue, and you have your dynamic products. In the intelligent cloud, you mainly have your Azure platform, but you have server products and cloud services, and you have your enterprise services as well. In your more personal computing, you have your Windows OEM, your Windows commercial, you have your Xbox content, your Surface revenue, and your search advertising from that platform called Bing or something like that. Many people, some people might know about it, right? 
So forecasted growth for Microsoft is not as big as we saw with Redfin or Huya. Right now, it's expected to grow 9.6% 9, 9 on annual average for the next three to five years. I believe these are actually pretty impressive numbers for a company that's this big. Microsoft stock right now is more of a safe growth play that pays dividend. So I do believe, again, I'm not always focused on crazy growth stocks. I'm not only focused on companies that I believe that might not be profitable right now and I expect to go profitable. I'm a very open-minded investor, if I want to say. I believe I invest in companies that I believe will grow and if I see potential in them, especially potentials that are going to be better than the overall market, I invest. So what are some of the reasons I purchased I purchased Microsoft? Microsoft is in multiple markets that I'm incredibly bullish. My two favorites right now are the cloudy market, which is still seeing strong growth. And we looked at Intel's earnings report last week, and Intel mentioned that they are still seeing very huge uh, amount of growth with cloud providers, and Microsoft is a cloud provider. So I, I do believe that's going to be very beneficial for Microsoft Azure. The second market is the gaming, and Microsoft is releasing the new Xbox console. It's moving into the cloud and gaming and the recent acquisitions of gaming studios and the partnership with Facebook Gaming is really showing how Microsoft is very aggressive in the growth they want to see. Some of the major risks I see with Microsoft right now are one, right now there is enormous competition with some big boys, mainly in the clouding market. We have Amazon AWS, we have Google Cloud. Those two are giants in here right now. And they're also in the game clouding business as well. So we have some, some huge competition right there for Microsoft. Uh, but I believe there's definitely plenty of market share for them all to grow. The second is Microsoft is already a considerable size. So it could be a bit difficult for it to grow. But we saw with Apple, even a $1 trillion company can go to $2 trillion in a matter of a few months. So it's not a true, true risk, but it's definitely something to mention. So that's it for today's episode. I hope you guys enjoy it. Like always, if you want to know what I buy, I actually post my things on my Discord channel free to anybody that wants to join. But again, if you guys want to do full, if you guys want to view my full reports, check out my Patreon. It's I, I promise it. Check out my Patreon. Great content if you want to support the channel. And I truly, truly appreciate it. So take care, guys. Have a good night and see you next time.